Hello again, my friends. This is Kunita. I greet you warmly in the name of our risen Lord, Yeshua, Almighty God. And I welcome you back to an Eventide devotional. You know, for many of us, as we look back on our walk with the Lord, the biggest problem, the biggest problem we've had in trying to reach out and share our faith and strive to whatever calling the Lord has laid on our heart has been fear. A deep-seated, many-leveled fear. Fear of rejection from friends. Fear of isolation. Fear of physical harm. It can come in many forms. But there's no denying that the greatest hindrance to our usefulness, to our increasing in the gifts, the gifts available from His Holy Spirit, is our own fear. And with this in mind, from the Word of God out of the book of Second Timothy. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You see, Paul understood the power of fear to hinder us in our walk. And because he understood this, he therefore warns Timothy against this very scourge, this very demon that always seemed to insinuate itself in our path. Quite specifically, Paul says, God has not given us the spirit of fear so as to be afraid of men or devils or of what they will say or do, or even as to be discouraged, or sink beneath their challenge, or to be deterred from the work that our Lord has called us to. It was through fear, my friends, that the slothful servant buried his talent in his backyard for fear of taking it boldly into the world, that he might gain increase unto our Master. God himself has armed and warned us repeatedly of this spirit of fear that we should not live and walk in fear. Fear not the face of man, he says. Fear not the dangers you may meet within the path I have laid out for you. For he has delivered us from the spirit of fear and has given us instead a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. The spirit of power is a spirit of courage and resolution, my friends. Power to encounter foes and dangers. Power to bear up and withstand under trials. Power to triumph to whatever persecution may befall our path. What I'm trying to say is that it is in the very nature of the Spirit of God, my friends, once He has taken up residence within us to inspire our hearts and our minds with His eternal and infinite courage to overcome all difficulties and all dangers. And truth be told, when the Lamb of God is fired up by this pouring out of the Spirit with all its abounding love for God, for our risen Lord, and for all of His lambs, this mature believer, my friends, is not, is not easily intimidated by any adversary no matter how cunning. 
for the mature Lamb of God does not seek his own ease and comfort so that he would easily fall into the trap as the natural man does. The mature lamb strives for the glory of God only, for the passions of Christ and for the eternal lives of souls. And for this calling, for our calling in this world, we have been given by Almighty God Himself a sound and a tempered mind that we may speak and act in His name and under His power, that we might rightly divide and dispense His words in all truth and in knowledge. The Greek word denotes one of a sober mind, a man of prudence and discretion. The state refers to here is that in which the mind is well and evenly balanced, fully under godly influences, in which it sees things in their just proportions, and yet also understands the unveiled mystical spiritual relationships that bind all things. To possess this spirit of a sound mind, my friends, is to have an inspired judgment in the things of God. As you come to know Him, you will understand truth and not be drawn aside by every passing opinion. You will not be allured by every new and novel doctrine spouted out by those who seek their own glory and not His. Neither will you be charmed by every fresh device of the evil one, and you will not be caught unawares of his flesh-pleasing snares. I tell you, unless we had this gift, this gift of spiritual sobriety, this ripe and matured mind, this judgment, and this firm establishment in the truth of God, we are almost certain, as so many others have, to be drawn aside into some error, or perhaps worse. A friend will beguile us. Satan will somehow deceive us. Or it could simply be the circumstances of our lives that will entrap us. Pride. Pride and presumption will inflate us in our desires, will entangle us in a maze of confusion and error, in the subtle deceits that come into a mind who is not matured and ripe in the spirit, will grow until they betray us on the altar of our own makings, my friends. We have seen it over and over many times. But what we have also seen is where God has instilled a sound mind and a heart of love for Him and a spirit of power. There, there, there will be a sound faith, a solid hope, a burning love, a sincere repentance and a sure work of grace upon His heart from first to last. Oh, my friends, to have this soundness of mind is to have a mind deeply imbued and fully impregnated with the truth of Almighty God. And as His truth is the only real and solid and enduring truth throughout all creation, it follows then that only those who seek Him, who encounter Him, and who are drawn to love and know Him for themselves, his lambs. His lambs are the only people truly possessed of any soundness of mind. For this gift of soundness of mind that Paul talks about is a gift of the Spirit, a flower of the Spirit, a fruit of the Spirit. For only the children of God 
have the wisdom of God and the mind of Christ. As it is written, happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gets understanding, for the gaining of it is better than the gaining of silver and the profit of it better than that of fine gold. She is more precious than rubies. None of the things you can desire are as to be compared to her. Few, however, seem to know, and even fewer still, appear to prize this heavenly wisdom as Solomon talks about, this divine teaching, this unction, and this anointing from the Holy One which teaches and imparts all things unto His Beloved. The religious mind of the natural man seem satisfied with the religions and the testimonies of other men. Rituals and ceremonies lead many away. The tickling of the ears satisfies others. A fine building, a written creed, a friendly, family, homey atmosphere and a smiling pastor is enough for the Sunday believer and the approval of men and the flattery of their own hearts are the payoffs for many but as these people despise and toss away and fail to look upon the wisdom of Almighty God what they do not see what they cannot see is the total insufficiency, the emptiness, and the final delusion of all these forms, forms and shadows and rituals, and all of the apparatus they have created to inspire and empower the wisdom of men. Is that it is vain and empty and when their spiritual poverty caves in upon them like a thief in the night, when all they cherish is made desolate, and their nakedness and poverty stare them coldly in the face, then and only then do they realize that they are lost. Lost without a rag to cover them, a refuge to hide them, or a plea or, to plea, or a plea there we go, to avail them. With this thought firmly in our minds, my friends, it is my plea for you tonight, as Paul exhorted Timothy, to stir up the gift of God that is within you. Stir them up as fire under the embers. Stir them and exercise them lest they atrophy and melt away. For the divine law of the Spirit has always been that we must seek in order to gain and we must use in order to possess. For as our Lord said in Matthew, to him that hath shall more be given. We must all take opportunities to use, to stir, to grow our gifts. Only as we seek and search and exercise these gifts of His Spirit will we possess this sobriety of judgment and any wisdom in the things of God that we may not fall into the traps and the delusions that I talked about earlier. Do you not see, my friends, do you not understand life the life of a lamb, life in the spirit, is empowered and sustained by life. We must be connected to him. I'm trying to think of the word here, it's in vital, tangible ways.
for our life as we know it is his life. It is God's ordained law throughout the cosmos that life is empowered and sustained only through him. This law is expressed to us as, as his grace. The believer lives unto and within this spirit. And this life, our life springs from and is nourished only by life the life of our risen Savior. Our soul lives and possesses true vitality only in Him. And it is fed and nourished by His living Spirit that He has implanted in each of His lambs. Truly it is the blood that makes atonement and gives us life. But it is the coming of the Spirit at our Lord's bidding that nourishes and empowers our lives with all the riches of our Father's bounty. And without this, we are but clanging cymbals. We are but useless noise. Useless noise. <laughs> I tried to say two different words at the same time. But you understand what I'm trying to say, my friends. The difference between the Lamb of God is this infilling of the Spirit that overcomes his fears with the Spirit of power, the Spirit of love, and with a sound mind. For the truth be told, with only these three gifts in his abundance, love, power, and a sound mind, the Lamb of God can do all things. And certainly, He can accomplish all that God has called Him to do. Amen. I was going to say something, but perhaps I better not. <laughs> My friends, until the next time, have a wonderful evening in our risen Lord. Good night.